Hi, Bot Builders. This is Andrea Galately from Team Witch Doctor on the TV show BattleBots. And this is episode two of Witch Doctor Jr., made possible by Send Cut Send. Today, we're going to get started building your very first small scale BattleBot. In episode one, we talked about how to get started and which parts to buy. If you haven't seen it yet, you should go back and watch it to make sure that you have all the information you need to follow along today. I'm going to be building the FingerTech Viper Kit in today's video but you can follow along with these steps even if you're starting your build from scratch. If you simply follow the instructions that come with the Viper Kit, you'll end up with a working robot pretty quickly. However, the goal of this video series is to make sure that you understand enough about your robot to not just build it, but also be able to fix it and customize it. So I encourage you to slow down and take the time to learn with me instead of just rushing through your build. I know, I know, you can't wait to drive your robot. But you've heard builders say time and time again that battles are won and lost in the pits. And I promise, having a great understanding of how your robot works will definitely win you battles. I know you can't wait to open up your kit, so let's take a look at what's inside. You'll see the basic parts that you need to build a robot, no matter what weight class. Whether it's the 250 pound robots you see on TV, or the 1 pound robot we'll be building today. Starting on the right here, I'm not showing the battery, but you're going to need a battery and a way to connect it to your robot. You're going to need a receiver which is going to connect to your transmitter to make sure that you have control of the robot. Connected to the receiver is going to be its speed controller to so make sure that you can control the speed of your motors. You're going to need an on-off switch for safety, which is going to be required at any event you go to. You're going to need hubs to be able to attach your wheels onto your motors. You're going to need basic hardware and tools to install it. This is also a tool to install the wheels for this specific kit. You're going to need armor and a chassis to put it all in. And obviously you're going to need a transmitter to control it with. Now let's start following the instructions that come with your kit. We talked a lot about safety in episode one, and we'll probably touch on it again in every episode. You are now building a real combat robot, and as you might expect, that can be dangerous. Make sure to read these safety tips carefully before you move on. This next section here is about battery safety. I'm actually going to skip over this for now because I really want to take the time to discuss it in more detail. I do want to point out that the batteries you're using here are much more serious than the ones you typically use at home. So I'll show you how to use them and charge them safely. Until then, please do not charge your battery yet. I repeat, do not charge your battery yet. You can risk damaging the battery or even starting a fire. We'll dive into battery safety soon in another episode. One of the robots built by a kiddo at our makerspace is called Ring of Fire. And trust me, it earned that name while its battery was on the charger. All right, it's finally time to start building your first robot. Look through the parts in your kit and find the motor and speed controller. This is what the motor looks like. And this will be your speed controller. You probably already have a pretty good idea of what a motor does. So let's start by talking about the speed controller. If you were to take the power directly from your battery to your motor, it would go full speed right away. You would have no way to slow it down and no way to stop it without physically disconnecting the battery. Obviously, this wouldn't work for your robot, since you need to be able to drive it using the remote control. The speed controller uses a signal from your remote control, which is also called the transmitter, and tells the motor how fast to go. In other words, the speed controller controls the battery power sent to the motor to match your commands. You're not ready to turn your speed controllers on yet, but I'll show you how it looks on this robot that I already have built. The speed controllers you're using have a little light that indicates what it's doing. When I push the drive stick forward like this, You'll see that light turn green. That means that it's going forward. When I go in reverse, it turns red. This is a really quick way to check that it's working correctly. You'll see that there's a bunch of wires coming out of your speed controller, and this could look a little overwhelming. As you can probably guess from what we've already learned, the speed controller will need to connect to your battery to get power, so that's these wires here. It will need to connect to your motor to deliver that power, and that's going to be with these wires here. And it's also going to need to connect to your remote control system to get the commands that you're sending. And that's going to be with these wires. We'll start connecting it soon. But first, let's talk about motors. A motor uses battery power to make something spin, like a wheel or a weapon. Even though we call this whole part a motor, there's actually two parts to it. There's the motor, and then there's a gearbox attached to it. If you use the motor by itself without the gearbox, it would spin way too fast. A gearbox uses gears to slow down the motor and turn that speed into pushing power instead. We'll call that pushing power torque, so you start sounding like a robot builder. I'll show you what's inside this gearbox so you don't have to take yours apart to see it. The parts inside the gearbox are pretty small and they can be tricky to put back together.
You'll notice on this sticker here that it says 33 to 1. That means that the gearbox on this motor is making it 33 times slower. But here's the best part. That means that this combination now also has 33 times more pushing power or torque. Have you ever seen two robots get into a pushing match in the middle of the battle? The one that wins is not necessarily the fastest one, but it's the one that has the most pushing power. If you go on the Fingertech website, you'll see that they actually sell these same motors with different gearboxes, from 11 to 1 all the way to 600 to 1. Are you ready for some math? According to the specs for this motor, which you can find on Fingertech's website, this motor spins at almost 12,000 revolutions per minute using the battery that comes with the kit. That's really fast. The speed of the motor can be a little different depending on which battery you choose, and I'll explain why in a future episode. But for now, just know that the numbers we're using are for the battery that comes with your kit. Since the sticker says 33 to 1, that means that the gearbox divides this number by 33. So instead of spinning at 12,000 revolutions per minute, it will be spinning at about 350 revolutions per minute. That sounds a lot more reasonable, right? So let's take this to an extreme. If instead of using this 33 to 1 gearbox, we used a 300 to 1 gearbox, what do you think would happen? This side should be a lot slower, but it should also have a lot more pushing power. So let's see how that looks. Even by trying to spin this by hand, I can tell that this side has a lot less resistance to me turning the wheel than this side. In fact, on this 300 to 1 gearbox, I can't even turn the wheel by hand. I have a roll of duct tape under the robot so that the wheels aren't on the ground when we do our test. So I'm going to turn on the transmitter and turn the switch on so we can try our functional test. When I go forward, you can see that this wheel is spinning a lot faster than this wheel. A robot with 301 gearboxes would be way too slow, but it would have a ton of pushing power and probably win every pushing match. The gearbox that comes with your kit is actually a pretty good combination of speed and pushing power or torque, but it's good for you to have a good understanding of these concepts so that you can design your own robot one day soon. Okay, now that we know how motors and speed controllers work, let's start connecting them. Do you remember which wires go to your motors? Start by taking a close look at your instruction manual from Fingertech. It's going to show you exactly where to put each wire so that it's wired correctly the first time. If you get this wrong, your robot will go backward when you tell it to go forward. If you notice that you got these wrong later on, it's really easy to switch them, so it's not a big deal. But let's try to get it right anyway so your robot works the first time you try it. If you look at the back of the motor where the terminals are, you'll notice this little red dot. That helps you figure out which wire goes where. You could take the blue and purple wire on the speed controller and just split them apart a bit to make them a little bit easier to handle. You take this connector right here on the blue wire and we're going to put that on the side with the red dot. So you're just going to slide the connector right over the terminal. All you need is a gentle push. Make sure not to push it too hard so that the terminal actually bends. It's easy enough to bend it back into place using needle nose pliers or even your hands, but after you bend them back and forth a few times, they can break. So let's just try to be gentle with them. I'll hook up the purple wire as well, and now the speed controller is connected to our first motor. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other side. As you saw in the instruction manual, this motor is actually going to be wired backward from the first motor. When you switch the wires on the motor terminals, it makes the motor spin in the opposite direction. So why do we need to do this? If both motors were on the same side of the robot, like this, they could spin in the same direction as shown by these arrows, and the robot would move forward. However, since your robot only has two wheels, it's going to have a motor on each side. Once I flip this motor over to the opposite side, you'll notice that the arrows are now pointing in opposite directions. This means that when you try to drive forward, the robot would actually turn in a circle. We need to flip this arrow here so that they're both facing the same way. We'll do that by switching the wires on the terminals for this motor, and then your robot would drive forward correctly. So a good tip to know is that your left side is always going to be wired backwards from your right side. I'm going to split these wires again, and this time the purple wire is going to go on the red dot. So I'm going to just carefully put this over the terminal, and you can tug a little bit to make sure that it's on there securely. And then we'll do the same thing for the blue wire. Now we have each motor connected to its speed controller. As a bonus, Let's try to figure out how fast your robot would drive with these motors. Now you can get through this whole build without any math, but where's the fun in that? Let's put your math classes to use to give you an edge in the arena. Earlier, we figured out that the motors in your kit with the 33 to 1 gearboxes spin at about 350 RPM. 
This means that your wheels turn 350 times every minute. If we figure out how far your robot moves each time the wheel turns once, then we can figure out the speed. So how do we do that? We actually have a few ways to do this. We could take a physical measurement using a ruler, or we could use some math to calculate the result. Let's do both to make sure we have the right answer. To measure the distance with the ruler, let's mark a line on the tire so that we can see how far it's rotated. Let's start with that line right down on the paper, and we'll make a mark here. Now let's roll the tire forward until the line touches the paper again, which is one full revolution, and we'll make another mark right there. Perfect. Now let's just measure the distance with the ruler. Looks like about seven inches. And that's how far your wheel turns in one rotation. Now let's see if we could get the same answer with some math. Do you remember how to calculate the circumference of a circle? It may sound complicated, but all you need to know is the diameter of your wheel and multiply that by pi, which is always 3.14. You can use a calculator if that makes it easier. The wheels that came with your kit are 2.25 inches in diameter. So that makes your circumference just about seven inches. So now we've confirmed that with each turn of the wheel, your robot moves forward seven inches. You also know that your wheels turn 352 times in one minute, but a minute is kind of a long time. So it might be better to figure out how far it travels in one second. There's 60 seconds in a minute, so we'll just divide the number of revolutions by 60. So your robot will move forward seven inches, six times. So we multiply six times seven, and we know that you move forward about 42 inches in one minute, which is about three and a half feet. Now we know that your robot moves forward three and a half feet every second. Now let's see if that's true. These tape marks are three and a half feet apart. I'll drive as fast as I can from here to here, and we'll time it. According to our calculation, it should take about one second for the robot to drive from this line to that line. I'm driving this robot outside of the arena because there are no pets or ankles around, and I don't have a weapon on this robot. Always make sure to do testing like this safely. All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. Okay, that was pretty fast. Just as we expected, it's about one second. The arena you will compete in will be anywhere from four feet to as big as eight feet, which means you'll be able to drive from wall to wall of the arena in about two seconds. By looking at these numbers, you could probably already tell that if you used a bigger wheel, you could actually move forward further with each revolution, meaning that your robot would drive faster. As long as you're using the same motors and batteries, whether you get extra speed from your wheel size or your gearbox, you're still sacrificing pushing power. Once you're designing your own robot from scratch, you'll have to decide what works best for your design. See, math can help you build better robots. Now you know how to use motors and speed controllers. You also learned some other new words like torque, which is the pushing power of your robot, and transmitter, which is another word for your remote control. Try to start using these new terms so you start sounding like a robot builder. I would like to thank Send Cut Send for making this video possible. Once you start building your robot, you're pretty quickly gonna wanna start designing your own robot parts. Like most people, you probably don't have a way to cut metal at home. Send Cut Send makes it easy and affordable to get your parts made quickly. They use a high powered laser to cut metal parts in a process called laser cutting. The laser is computer controlled so that it can quickly make an extremely accurate line through the material that it's cutting. You can learn more about it on their blog at sendcutsend.com slash blog. The next step to get this robot running is to connect the rest of the electronics. We'll do that in the next episode. I know we jumped into a lot of information in this video, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I'll see you at episode three, where we'll learn how to connect more of your robot's electronics. Until then, happy building!